History is tragedy, not melodrama. In melodrama, all heroes have perfect virtue. All villains are perfectly bad, but nothing is like that. All of the Roosevelt's, including Eleanor, were deeply wounded people, deeply yeah. flawed people, along with their great strengths. In fact, we live in this superficial media culture in which we presume that heroism is perfection. And it isn't. The Greeks invented it. Achilles has his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strength. So what heroism is, are the gods setting up stories for us mere mortals to look at and realize, oh, they're negotiating between these factions within themselves. And sometimes that's not a negotiation. It's a war. Hi, this is Ken Burns, documentary filmmaker, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode. Today I'm here with the incomparable Ken Burns. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be with you. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? <laughs> I, I invented this job, I guess. I've wanted to be a filmmaker since I was 12. I started my own company just basically the second I got out of... Um, out of college, which meant taking a vow of anonymity and poverty. I was making documentary films for PBS on American history that I moved to the, the, the house I'm living in in August of, of 79. So you do the math. It's 42 and a half years living in the same house still. Um, I'm happy that the anonymity and the poverty uh, never really uh, continued, uh, but it was certainly there for uh, a while. And I've just continued to do the same thing. I've only uh, made films uh, that were broadcast on PBS and raised the money myself. And so it's kind of zero sum game, uh, each each one of them. So it's it's a completely unique kind of job. And, and at the same time, I make documentary films, which lots of people do. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest that I'm completely fanboying right now. So I'm, I'm, trying to control my excitement and emotion to, you know, sort of meet the icon, the Godfather, kiss the ring, you know, um, <laughs> I have so many questions. I'm just I'm, in the simple olive oil business. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's so much I want to ask you, um, you know, my audience, uh, people who read Inc magazine and other entrepreneurs and, and innovators who are maybe quietly secretly plotting their escape from working in corporate America, um, I want to talk about signals because I think signals are so important. You talk about sort of coming out of the womb, you know, with a camera and wanting to, to tell stories and whatnot. And uh, you certainly uh, doubled down on this idea that uh, the riches are in the niches. And, you know, you've been this quintessential, the quintessential with the, with the article, uh, the documentary filmmaker. What were the signals that this was going to become your life and career? Well, you know, I think in an interesting way, Brian, this is born in tragedy. My mother had cancer from the time I was about two years old. She died a little bit before my 12th birthday when I was 11. Uh, my father had a fairly strict curfew, but he'd forgive it so that I could watch documentary. I mean, watch any kind of films on TV with him, documentaries, feature films. We'd go out to the movies on a school night, stay up really late. And I saw my dad cry and he'd never cried before. And so I realized instantaneously, I was 12 by then. I wanted to be a filmmaker. That meant Alfred Hitchcock or John Ford or Howard Hawks, mid 60s, since 1965. And so I sort of set my sights on that. And then I went to Hampshire College, which was brand new, uh, just had opened in 70. I came in the fall of 71. And um, it was a whole new experimental college. And you sort of designed your own curriculum. I met these extraordinary social documentary still photographers. My dad had been an amateur photographer. So that kind of connected. And all of a sudden, I didn't want a Hollywood career. I didn't even want a career. I wanted a professional life that I controlled and I wanted to do it in documentary. And it turned out I had this completely untrained and latent uh, interest in American history. The last history course I took in college was Russian history. Um, <laughs> And I've just been laboring in that vineyard of, of American history ever since. So there are a few things, you know, my mom's death 
And that's not fun to watch that over years and years and years, watching my father's response, watching movies, wanting to be a feature filmmaker, going to Hampshire, being sort of having my molecules rearranged by its dynamic, still is dynamic kind of transformational, not transactional um, you know, mojo that it had. And then realizing that I didn't want to just sort of work my way up some rung. I wanted to do what I wanted to do to be that Hollywood auteur and, and, and be responsible. I, I want to be able to have a conversation, you know, 50 years later with somebody like you and not blame anybody else. If you don't like a film, if you don't like a film, it's all my fault. I, I work with really great people and they're responsible for why these films are good or people think that they're good, but if it's bad, it's all my fault. And I take the blame and I wanted to do that. And it's interesting that it has been with PBS has one foot tentatively in the marketplace and the other proudly out. And I really wholeheartedly subscribe to that, or I take advantage of it in a way. I just, each, each film project is its own LLC. You fill it with whatever it takes to make the film and you don't, there's no profit margin. There's no uh, uh, contingency. It's just, you get paid a salary when it's over, it's over. Uh, so it's a zero sum game. And I've been able to, to do that in a way that I'm, proud of each of the films that I've released. Yeah, well, you certainly are leaving a legacy, um, some incredible films, iconic films. Your latest, Ben Franklin's another masterpiece, loved it. Um, Hemingway was terrific, uh, Ali, I mean, Vietnam, country music, baseball, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly a huge fan. I wanna go back in the chronology a little bit, um, and it's, I'm, you know, even all these years later, I still feel okay saying, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. Um, it's so tough. I can relate. I'm sure as a lot of people can, yeah. who, who have childhood trauma. Um, I have, I've had my share and I'm sure my audience can also relate with their share. And I want to try and connect the dots between, you know, you wanting to become Alfred Hitchcock and, and trying to get a hold of coping with that trauma. What was it you think um, about films or storytelling or filmmaking that sort of helped you cope? It sounded like that became sort of a coping mechanism. Um, you certainly picked the path right away. What, what do you think? I'm trying to connect the dots here between yeah, these two uh, It's a, such a smart and thoughtful question. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the signs was when my dad cried, we were watching a film by Sir Carol Reed about the Irish troubles called Odd Man Out with James Mason. And I realized instantly that my dad, who had not cried while my mom is sick, had not cried when she died, had not cried at the funeral, which had been noted by my friends. And I, I was aware that they didn't think that was a good thing and that I was trying to be protective of. All of a sudden I went, aha, I get it. That film had offered some emotional safe haven. Now I wish I could tell you that for me, it was a way to cope. I think it was the other way around. I think I built a kind of, you know, bunker. And it, and even, even as I was giving the world signs of telling them in my first film that I did, uh, that ended up being broadcast by PBS on the Brooklyn Bridge, I said that I was an emotional archaeologist. I was uninterested in excavating the dry dates and facts and events of the past as much as I was in some emotional truth. And I didn't mean sentimentality or nostalgia. I meant something that's higher, you know, something that our founders felt when they created our country, that they felt that if you gave people the ability to govern themselves, it would liberate all these energies. John Adams famously said, I study war and politics so that my son may study uh, commerce and business so that my grandson may study art and music, you know, yeah. and that's, that, that's sort of, what the pursuit of happiness was. It, it, it wasn't property as, as Jefferson could have said, but pursuit of happiness is kind of lifelong learning. And it really took me a long time for this trauma, this repressed kind of not expressed trauma to catch up to me. And I must've been 40. It was a year or so after the civil war series uh, came out. Um, it, it, it just sort of hit me. And I realized now I sort of had to deal with it and, and I began to integrate it. Now, just to back up, this April 28th, it, I will have been without a mom for 57 years. You know, that is way, way too long to yeah. be on a planet without your mother. So that's still a day-to-day -day 
a feeling and sensation, but at least in the early nineties, I was able to reclaim it and, and sort of not make it work for me, but just see it in a way that, that helped the kind of release that you're suggesting happen right away. And film and family have been the two ways. I have four daughters, you know, 39, 35, uh, almost 17 and 11. And, you know, that's a big spread. And um, they they have given me the kind of feedback necessary to stay honest, as your kids do. But the work has too. And the people that I've worked with have been able to um, help me uh, in that journey. But it's it's ongoing. And anybody, as you say, that's listening, you included, who's had that kind of childhood trauma knows that the half-life of grief is endless. It's not about getting rid of it. It's about having a real relationship to it and understanding it. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't still overtake and create sadness, but that's, you know, none of us are getting out of here alive. You know, my mom left at 42 years old. I'm 68, you know, um, it's, it's a complicated thing. And none of us, uh, it's, you know, none of us, no exception is going to be made in our case and we're going to live forever. And, and I think in the back of everybody's mind, there's that, oh, well, maybe it might happen. So I think that all of us are having that kind of ultimate uh, relationship. My uh, late ex-father-in-law um, really hit it on the head. He was a psychologist. And he said, you know what you do? I said to him, I, I didn't seem to be able to remember the anniversary of my mom's death. It was always approaching and then receding, but I was never present. He said, I bet you blew the candles out on your birthday cake, wishing she'd come alive. And I said, yeah, how'd you know? And he said, look what you do for a living. You wake the dead. You make Jackie Robinson and Abraham Lincoln and Louis Armstrong come alive. Who do you think you're really trying to wake up? And, I, and then all of a sudden it was the, the merging, yeah. Of, of, the, of the professional life, which had done its best to sort of mask and hide with the personal life. And there was some, some breakthrough. And now I've been unafraid to talk about it. In fact, I think it's helpful to talk about it. And, and a lot of people come up to me and say, I get it, you know, waking the dead. That's what I do for a living. I make people who are long gone come alive. And there's only one person that I really want to make that happen. That's not going to happen. But then this is a way in which, you know, some lemonade has been made from a whole, whole bunch of lemons. And that's, that's almost a definition of life. It's just, it's not that, that into some life, some problems will come. Everybody will have problems. Everybody will have loss. Everyone will have grief. And it's, it's really, I guess, what you do with it, how honest you are with yourself, how you respond to it, how you get help from others, how you seek community. And so my films are a reflection of the United States, good and bad. I've, I've been saying and I've been making for, you know, almost 50 years films about the U.S., but I've also been making films about us. That is to say the lowercase two letter plural pronoun, all the intimacy of us and all of the majesty, the complexity, the contradiction, and even the controversy of the US. And so I think in a way, a healing has taken place within my professional life and it has come to my personal life and things have happened in my personal life that I hope I've brought some emotional intelligence uh, to the professional life. So good. sorry, I didn't mean to go on for so long. Oh, no, no. Uh, first, you know, I was doing this because I was getting yeah. goosebumps. Um, so good. And, and you know, it's funny. Uh, I've been doing this interview thing for about a decade now, and um, I still sometimes catch myself being pulled into the conversation and like, oh, wait, I'm interviewing. <laughs> I'm not just a spectator here. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I've been interviewing. I realized this month. It's been 50 years since I conducted on film my first sound interview. Uh, I was terrified. And I tell you, I'm still terrified when I do an interview because if it doesn't go well, it's all my fault. And if, if it goes well, it's, it's because you're terrific. You know what I mean? And, and that's the way I've, I'm always perpetually a student. And I think that's good. And I do remember with Rachel Robinson, Jackie's widow, just listening and then suddenly forgetting my job and crying, you know, and having to go cut because yeah. you got me. Well, and I think that's where, well, you know, if, if you're a storyteller um, or filmmaker, that's a signal that you're in that zone and that's where the magic happens. I think. Yeah. No, it's yeah. a, it's almost a trance like thing. And, and just a, you know, history is mostly made up of the word story plus 
hi. And that's a good way to begin a story. Today is also Jackie Robinson's birthday. Oh, so, okay. I mean, there's there's um, you know, a lot of good things that we're talking about interviewing and feelings, yeah. goosebumps. Yeah, we're, we're, we're ringing the bells. I want to go back um, and just unpack all the phenomenal things you just said and maybe extract a couple of lessons because they, they may be subtle. And I want to remind the audience kind of what you said, or at least what I heard. Um, you're right. None of us is going to get out of this life alive. <laughs> I think that's sort of what you said in summary. Yes. Uh, and, and we will, I mean, I feel a hundred percent confident saying that all of us will have trauma, whether it's little T or big T uh, or, or several along the way. And, and I do agree with you based on my own experience that um, you never get over these things. Um, it's been explained to me that um, it's something we learn to dance with, you know, and as, as sometimes it's a wrestle and, you know, we get pinned or maybe choked out <laughs> or, uh, and sometimes we learn to dance with it and it comes and it goes. The other thing I heard you say that I think was really brilliant is that and I felt this way before too, that we really can't live in the present until we reconcile our past. Hmm. So whether we recognize that we're carrying along this baggage or not, you know, of grief or a tragedy or something like that, if, once we recognize that we've been carrying it along, I think the weight of it um, starts to unload. Yeah. Uh, at least we can begin to deal with it in a way. And, and, you know, sounds like you recognized it um, maybe 38 plus years into your journey, and then you started dealing with it and, um, and you ended up incorporating. I think that's maybe a lesson, even if you're not a filmmaker, um, that people who are running their own business, whatever they're doing, uh, they're an attorney, uh, a CPA running their dad's uh, plumbing business, whatever it is, a flower shop on, the, uh, on Main Street. Um, I think that's a super good lesson to sort of, it's almost like judo. It's the way it works, right? Like judo is all about using the enemy's momentum against them. And you sort of, you know, use it to, to throw them on the floor. And that's what you might be able to do um, with grief or pain, uh, incorporating it into your um, business somehow, your life somehow to be able to use it to your advantage. Um, I think that's a really interesting way of, of putting it. it. It's most definitely true that those of us who dwell in the past, and I don't mean what I do professionally, I'm, I'm interested in history and telling stories, but that history took place in a present, and I'm trying to find that present and bring it as close as I can. But those of us who are burdened by the past, you know, that can weigh us down. And those of us who are anxious usually means something about the future. And so there's really only alternative, which is to sort of be here now. And that's a really important lesson for everyone. It's at the heart of the of all of the great religions is a kind of sense of one's position, mindfulness in this present now. And it's a beginning of the way to heal both the future worries, anxiety, and the past um, scars, uh, the traumas, the depressions, whatever uh, label you want to put it. And, and I think that in a way, um, judo is a pretty good analogy because I think what you want to do is say, look, this, if I wish this to go away, it's never going to go away. And I've got to find a way to live with it, to use it uh, and the energy that's, that's in it, the kinetic energy, the, you know, the emotional energy, the psychic energy, whatever you want to call it, and try to use it um, for good instead of the ill that it's doing to me yeah. and thereby, by extension to others. Well, it reminds me of some of your protagonist characters or, um, or subjects, features. So uh, like Roosevelt comes to mind as yes. this uh, boy who was born with all these health issues. Um, you know, you would never dream that this kid would become president. He was so, you know, sickly. poor health, weakly, you know, weakling, sickly, and literally, you know, willed himself and with effort, uh, you know, made himself into what he was and also was no stranger of tragedy. I mean, he lost his, his wife and his little boy. And it was just so he sad. Lost his wife and his mother on February 14th, the same day in the same house yeah. in Manhattan. And he went out West uh, to sort of 
kind of ignore his grief. I mean, it's it's just a, and then lost his youngest. Uh, he had pushed all his sons into service in World War I. He, you know, understood himself to be a kind of war monger. Mm-hmm. And he paid the price by losing his uh his youngest Quentin. I mean, it's it's just amazing. And his fifth cousin Franklin has, you know, is a robust, handsome, playboy, kind of thin, yeah. vicious guy. At 39, gets 39, gets infantile paralysis. And when that robs him, loved, loved to dance, loved to golf, couldn't do any of those, couldn't stand unaided again in his life, went on to lift our country out of the depression and through the second world war. Yeah, so these yeah. are what yeah, we're dealing yeah. with is our wounded people. I just learned a story recently. There's a late journalist, IF Stone, very, very left leaning uh, journalist. I interviewed him for a film on Huey Long, uh, the turbulence of demagogue. And at that time he was like 80. And he said to me, I'm learning Greek and Latin so I can read the classics in the original. And he did. I mean, it's amazing. But one of his acolytes came up to him and said, how can you admire Thomas Jefferson? And he said, because history is tragedy, not melodrama. In melodrama, all heroes have perfect virtue. All villains are perfectly bad, but nothing is like that. All of the Roosevelt's, including Eleanor, were deeply wounded people, deeply flawed people, along with their great strengths. In fact, we live in this superficial media culture in which we presume that heroism is perfection. And it isn't. The Greeks invented it. Achilles has his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strength. So what heroism is, are the gods setting up stories for us mere mortals to look at and realize, oh, they're negotiating between these factions within themselves. And sometimes that's not a negotiation. It's a war. And so we want to see how it comes out. So we play these tragedies out and they remind us of our own battles, the own obstacles that we're obligated to overcome. So when you study history and you come in contact with so-called ordinary people, people who landed, uh, you know, people from Iowa who had no interest in conquest in Europe, who landed at Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944, not going to get paid for it. They're not going to gain territory for it. They're there promoting ideas. I mean, how uh, there's no ordinary people we learned in making our film about World War II. And then you take the people that we do generally regard as extraordinary and you begin to see how very much like us they are, how beset they are by traumas, as you say, small and capital T, by flaws, by all these different circumstances. And it's what you do with that that matters. That's the whole thing of life. How, what, what, how do you relate to what is dealt to you? Yeah, and, and all of your characters or, or features, uh, and you know, the latest is Ben Franklin. I was, I was mesmerized. I had no idea about the deep history that he was basically born of nothing. And again, uh-huh. it's a self-made story of you know, picking yourself up from the bootstraps and, and like literally making your own luck, making it happen. It's uh, remarkable. It and is that. And he's not, look, he's not on the $100 bill for no reason. He right. is the symbol of American striving because he comes from a lower class and he puts himself up into a higher class. But more importantly, he understood how fallacious the notion of class is. And so he's the first person. I mean, first of all, he's a printer. He's got to do everything upside down and backwards. He's a great writer. He's a humorist. He's a scientist. He's a civic leader who understands it's better to work together than apart. He's the first person who understands that these disparate American colonies from Georgia to New Hampshire have in common some things that if they worked in common, it would work. He was a postmaster. Before, if if you mailed a letter from Savannah to Boston, it went through London. Yeah. And he's going, uh, no, no, no. And all of a sudden, 20 years before the revolution, he's the first one to conceptualize what it might mean for there to be an us yeah. all united. Even with the disparate, you got slaves. I mean, he had, he owned, he, he had, uh, he had enslaved some household servants and would later become an abolitionist. He's not like a lot of people in the North, which we forget, but, you know, he helped forge the compromise, the horrible compromises that ensured that we would have a United States. So kind of good on one hand and horrible on the other, because it treated 
all African slaves as three-fifths of a human being with zero rights. They were just there to bolster up the apportionment uh, for the Southern states. And so it set in motion all of the stuff that would end, you know, it would come to a culmination four score and five years later with, um, with the Civil War and, and also still going on with George Floyd and everything else. So Franklin's in the middle. And oh, by the way, there wouldn't be a United States without him because we don't win this war our revolution without French help. And he's the one, he is the one who gets it. And um, at, at that time, both he and, and, and sort of uh, Washington were seen as equal. And, and Franklin was smart enough to know that people will always go for the military hero. So he basically says, okay, George, it's yours. So George emerges as high above everyone else. But George knows, first person he goes to visit when he arrives in Philadelphia, he doesn't even check into where the inn or wherever he's staying. Uh, he for the Constitutional Convention, he goes to Benjamin Franklin, who's the person who made it possible for him to win Yorktown and all these other things. Yeah, and it was fascinating too. I think there's a lot of really great lessons in there too for modern day. I mean, uh, I mean honestly, Ken, and I'm not just a blowing smoke here. I, I think you know your films really hold up a mirror to society. At, at the present now, you know, yes. people who say history repeats itself, you know, Brian, it does not. It yes. doesn't ever repeat itself. But Mark Twain is supposed to say it rhymes. And I'd go back further to Ecclesiastes. Uh, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. That means human nature doesn't change, but the circumstances that humans face with so yeah, that yeah. when, you know, if you're talking, you know, you saw the Benjamin Franklin thing, what's it talking about? Oh, inoculations and failure to inoculate and get your kids vaccinated and what the costs are of that. Let's not give it away. But this is it's it's all science. It's all politics. It's all independence. It's all freedom. But as we know, in America, there are two kinds of freedom, the collective freedom, what we need often in opposition to the individual freedom, what I want. And is that what's going on today? Oh, I, I, you know, uh, what a surprise. Every single film I made feels like it's talking about today. And I never, I promise you, I spend the time. It's hard enough to tell these stories. It's hard enough to figure out what goes in a four hour, two part, four hour film on Benjamin Franklin, 40, 50, 60, a hundred times more material than we can possibly use. Same thing with the Ali thing, same thing with the upcoming thing on the America and the Holocaust. You've just got to concentrate on telling the story then. But when you finish, you lift up. And, uh, and now, since it's been nearly 50 years of doing this, you're just flabbergasted by the way in which it rhymes with the present. Yes. You know, people were doing, what, what, you know, Holocaust is about nativism. So is Benjamin Franklin, yeah. you know, race, uh, Native Americans. I mean, all of this stuff, anti-Semitism. I mean, it's just you can't make any of this up, which is why I've been happy to to sort of work the the uh the fields of documentary and not not feature films because you know the best stuff of feature films is stuff that's actually happened you know yeah, yeah i mean uh again there's so many great themes in the in the in the threat in the franklin project uh, diplomacy you know like he should be in the dictionary under diplomat diplomacy the way he could manage both sides and, and knew how to work a room and um, underserved personalities and politics. Um, and, you know, and his brain, you know, just to invent things. He's sort of like a, a to hold them without patent. Right, right. I've only come across that once before. My second film was on the Shakers, the celibate religious sect. And yeah. they think of them as sort of quaint and stuck in time. They were innovators. And so Clarence Borden looked at the milk evaporator they had made and took it and patented it. Yeah. And that's Borden's, right? And But they invented the flat broom, the circular saw, clothespins, all of this sort of stuff. And they held without patent yeah the and lightning rod and all that right. was really he said this is these are co collective things they belong to everybody and it's so opposite away the mentality of businesses which is proprietary his his idea was that that you want the individual to live to its fullest extent but you also realize that we're connected to one another. Now everything is divided one way or the other, and a libertarian can't possibly understand a role of government in this. And of course, you need to have government. That's who organized D-Day, right? You, you, you get the sense that he, he remembered when he was a have-not and there was the has. And so 
he, I think he sort of never forgot his roots when he was, you know, scraping to, to make ends meet, you know, escaping from servitude from his brother, the printing thing and the whole thing is just a great lesson. And, you know, there are some people now, uh, controversial Elon Musk, for example, uh, but he, you have to give credit to Elon that uh, sort of helping to electrify uh, America, at least in, in terms of vehicles and sharing, he has an open API for that, which Toyota and Ford and all these people are uh, benefiting from. He may have a, you know, a evil plan in mind where he sort of wants to own uh, the electricity. He may want to, you know, uh, take Edison out of the, out of the game, but um it just reminds me of how amazing Ben Franklin was, especially with, you know, the limited resources he had in his time. It's just, just absolutely. Well, you know what? I had an interview earlier today and someone asked me, he said, you know, so what would Franklin think about or the social media today? And I said, he, he was social media then. <laughs> like, like we all think that we, it's the technology that's is the tail that's wagging the dog. Who cares that Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever, as if this is some, he controlled printing. He had <laughs> newspapers. This was <laughs> it. He's, he's, he does almanacs. He's telling funny jokes. He's doing little uh, homespun stories. He's, you know, advertising for runaway slaves to be fought, caught and beaten. And, you know, I mean, this is all the bad stuff of the internet, all the good stuff of the internet, but it wasn't called the internet. It was called a newspaper. Well, right? he's the ultimate influencer too. He goes to, to France and he's this, you know. Celebrity. Uh, he celebrity. Takes He's Everyone, yeah. you, think, you think it's, you know, I think here, here's the arrogance of the present. Because we're alive, we think somehow we're better than those people that went before. That the conversation you and I are having in 2022, in the first month, the last day of the first month of 2022, is in any way better than 10,000 years ago. There were conversations much more deep and complicated, talking about exactly the same things that we're talking about, except these people knew their stuff. They knew exactly how to figure out the distance from here to there celestially. Do you? I don't. I can maybe go and look in a book, but they yeah. did, you know, and, and people and complicated emotions, as you and I have already talked about. These have been going on for as long as there have been human beings who have hearts that can be broken by loss or whatever it might be, you know, and it takes, you know, different forms in different times. Maybe it takes Pearl Haggard or Johnny Cash to explain in the simplest of words or, or Hank Williams, you know, I'm so lonesome. I could cry. There's no one on earth unless yeah, sure. they're lying to themselves. It doesn't know exactly, you know, hear that lonesome whippoorwill. He sounds too blue to fly. The midnight train is whining low. I'm so lonesome. I could cry. That's about as poetic as you can get. Yeah. Well, uh, as we sort of uh, round third and bring it home with the last couple of minutes here, um, for those who have not seen Franklin yet, when, when does it come out officially? Uh, April, April 4th and 5th on PBS. So nobody uh, has a um, ha ha can say that they have somehow failed me by not uh, seeing it, you know, because it'll be out April 4th and 5th for streaming, you know, on whatever PBS platform you have for free for several weeks. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from. Man.